tutorial, the power, the strength, the energy, the enthusiasm that we have for you tonight, for Pastor Lambo, the teacher for tonight. And it's not about him. It is not about his strength, his capacity, his knowledge, his wisdom. No, it's all about you, Lord. And we ask tonight, everything and everything that comes from Pastor Lambo, Lord, you have directed him. Coming straight from you, pass it on. You are using him as a vessel. You are using him as a servant of God. You are using him to bring the word tonight. Father, we give his life to you. We give his life to you tonight. And we are going to pray for him that the Lord, as you lay the Bible study in the manager, the Bible study is going to affect you throughout the world that you may begin the end. Let us pray for Pastor Lambo, who will be teaching tonight. Let us go to our prayers and pray for him. Father Almighty Father, God, in the name of Jehovah, we yes. thank you, Lord. We bless you, Holy Name. Father, you have ordained your servant to be teaching us tonight. Bring the Bible study to us tonight. Lord, we ask for wisdom for him. We ask that you give him the wisdom, the wisdom, the kind of wisdom that, that should pass us any wisdom. Lord, we ask that we, when you ask him, give him the word, it is it's going to be an extraordinary Bible study because, Lord, you are with him. We pray that you lift him up tonight. We pray that you give him the utterance and the clear understanding what he's about to study tonight. There is nothing about him, it is not by his power. It's not by his strength, it's not by his wisdom, but the spirit of the Lord. Therefore, Lord, we ask that your spirit be with him, your energy be with him, your power be with him. We pray that you elevate him to the highest level, my Lord, my God. He cannot do it by himself. We pray that the Lord you be with him tonight. Join him and point and direct him. He's not on his own. But the power that comes from you, his life is on you. We commit his life on you. We commit everything on you. Understanding the From the beginning of this Bible study, the understanding of the Lord, my God. Father, we pray that Pastor Lambo will lead the Bible study tonight. From the beginning to the end, we will have a successful Bible study tonight, my Lord, my God. We thank you. We bless your holy name. Father, we bless your holy name. We commit your servant unto you. We commit your servant unto you. We commit your servant unto you, my Lord, my God. Give him the wisdom. Give him the wisdom, my Lord, my God. We thank you. We bless you. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the life of Pastor Lambo. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 We're going to lift the Bible study onto his throne. We are going to pray that God from the beginning, when we start the Bible study to the end, it will go smooth. It will be successful. No disruption. But our, our unity. Everybody will bring their mind where it's, where it's supposed to be. Yes, we don't want divided mind. We want one unity. We want unity in the Bible study. Because we yes. want it to be successful. We want, yes. it, we want the Bible study to be successful in the week and a week before. And a week before. The nine is our nine. And we are going to have a successful Bible study. But we're going to commit the Bible study nine to the throne of God. He lead us throughout the beginning to the end. A successful Bible study made there tonight. Let us pray for the success of the Bible study tonight. Let us pray. Our help, Father, we thank you for tonight. Father, we commit the Bible study on you tonight. Father, we pray that from the beginning of the Bible study to the end, you would guide every aspect of the Bible study. <laughs> you would make it happen. You would pray for success. We pray for participation. We pray for excitement. We pray for understanding what we are about to study tonight. My Lord, my God. Lord, I pray tonight, the way we came, we will not be back again. But we're filled with the 
the word. We'll be filled, our life will be full, we'll be filled with the word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tonight. We bless you, my Lord, my God. Jehovah, take control. We commit the rest of the Bible study unto you. We commit the Bible study unto you. The success of the Bible study hangs on you, my Lord, my God. Let it flow. Let your children. We can feel that yet. Great Bible study. Thank you, Lord. We bless your people. Take us so control. Take us so control. Bible study. Let's go. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Thanksgiving. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. And it's good to have gathered your children here tonight. Lord, we are here for only one thing. It's to learn more about you. It's to get to know more about you through the word. We are hungry. Let your children be thirsty and hungry to hear your word. To hear the word. My Lord, my God. Give us a spirit of learning. And let that spirit of learning be with us. Even after we finish the Bible study. My Lord, we commit the Bible study with you tonight. And everyone who attends the Bible study tonight will enjoy the Bible study. But for those who are unable to come tonight, for whatever reason, or guide them, be with them, and bring them next week for the Bible study. We thank you, Lord, I pray that you make a way for the Bible study tonight as we commit everything on you. I commit to the teacher on you. I commit all the members who are going to be on the Bible study tonight. And everyone unto you, my Lord, my God, open our hearts and give us a clear understanding, clarity of what we're about to say. We thank you. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray tonight. Thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Uh, good evening, everyone. Pastor Lambo, I pass it on to you. Thank you so thank much, Ada Obank, for the powerful prayer. Um, good evening, church. Uh, good evening. We are so blessed to come online tonight to study one of the most um, important doctrines of um, the life of a Christian. Uh, when we read um, some of us that have been able to read uh, a book like uh, Bringing Progress, we find out that uh, throughout the journey of a Christian, is is um, he has a, he had he had to carry a bag on his back, and every every step or every mile that he covers is dropping out something, because that bag on his back is a, is a heavy load that contains like my person I used to say, all is 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 bucket is bucket of um, of challenges, and that is what uh, uh, Apostle Peter is. Um, addressing in chapter 4 of um, first Peter the chapter 4 it's um, a chapter that really does not leave anybody out whether you are a pastor you are a bishop you are an ordinary member in the church all of us are touched all of us are challenged all of us are uh, one way or the other um, giving that challenge to examine ourselves to find out really are we following Christ? Can we really carry the cross and follow Christ? And that this is this is what uh, Apostle Peter is saying here. And also uh, you know trying to bring Jesus Christ into the picture as an example for us, which. We, 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 we cannot argue because if, if we really believe that Jesus Christ came to the world a hundred percent human being so so we cannot say that uh, but he's the son of God so 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 you, you could not uh, experience uh, the type of suffering that we can experience in the flesh because the, the most frightening thing for every human being is the modification of the of the flesh, the, the, that, 
the, that flesh is so sacred to us that some people cannot just suffer that uh, 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 the pain of the flesh. And that is what Apostle Peter is addressing in this chapter 4. That um, I will be so happy tonight if all of us, we don't really need to know the Bible, we don't really need to, to be a pastor, we don't really need to be a, an elder or anything, but this is something that uh, um, affects our daily life that you can also contribute tonight in this discussion. Because your contribution is going to help all of us too. Because if we if we're going to read this um, uh, chapter four, uh, from verse one to, I'm going to read from chapter I mean from uh, chapter four, verse one to eleven, and hopefully maybe if we are lucky tonight, we may be able to cover the first six six verses. So he said, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the loss of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walk in lewdness, we walk in lust, in drunkenness, in reveries, in drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. For, in regard to this, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Seven is that serving God's glory, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love covers a multiple of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, here we have the work of a Christian. The work of a Christian is twofold. One, doing the will of God and suffering his pleasure. So the work of a Christian, what we are here for is to do the will of God and also to suffer for God's pleasure. What do you mean by that? He said this chapter directs us in both. The duties we are here exercised to employ ourselves in are the mortification of sin, that is to try as much as possible to keep sin in check. Living to God, sobriety, in prayer, in charity, in hospitality and the best improvement of our talent which the apostle presses upon christians from the consideration of the time they have lost in their sins and the approaching end of all things so the apostle here draws a new inference from the constitution of christ's suffering he, he referred us again back to christ's suffering as he had done before, we made use of this to persuade to patient. Because if you remember in, in the previous verses and previous chapters, he referred us to, to persevere in patience, to be patient in persevering, to suffer in patience, to suffer, to be to be patient in suffering. So here again is now talking about mortification of sin. 
How can we put sin to check? How can we live without sin? What kind of sin? What do you understand by sin? You see, one, how the exhortation is expressed here. He said, the, 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 the antecedent that is, the way he was building his argument before, is that Christ had suffered for us in the flesh. So, so in other words, he's putting us, he's, he's giving us a, a checkmate that we cannot have any excuse that Christ has suffered for us in the flesh or in his human nature. You see, the consequence is, what is telling us, the conclusion is that we should arm and mortify ourselves likewise with the same mind, with the same courage and with, with the same resolution. The word flesh in the former part of this verse signifies Christ's human nature because if you remember, we have already uh, convinced us that Jesus Christ was born of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, Mary, but he came 100% human flesh. He, he suffered hunger, he suffered thirst, he suffered pain too. So that, so that, so that, so that he could, he, so that he could, he, he could uh, uh, experience what we are experiencing in the flesh as, as mortals even though he came as immortal. And the reason why even the Bible went forward to, to prove that he, he really came as, as a 100% human flesh, when, when he visited a Bethany and he saw Mat, uh, Mary and Martha weeping for Lazarus, he too, he wept. As a human being, he wept. So the word flesh in the former part of this verse signifies Jesus Christ as human nature. But in the later part, it signifies man's corrupt nature. That is the flesh, corrupt nature. So the sense is, as Christ suffered in his human nature, do you, according to your baptismal vow and profession, make your corrupt nature suffer by putting to death the body of sin by self-denial and mortification? In other words, that, 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 that is the meaning of baptism. That we were in, in, in sin before baptism, but, but when we were baptized, we were buried. We were buried in sin. But, but at the time we were raised up from the water, we, we, come, up, we, we, we come out with a, 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 with a sanctified body that we must never go back to sin again. So, so that we put to death the body of sin, by self-denial and mortification for if you do not don't suffer you will be you will be, you, you be uh, uh, um, conformable to Christ in his death and resurrection and we cease from sin so now what do we learn from this you see some of the strongest and best argument against all sorts of sin are taken from the suffering of Christ all sympathy and tenderness for Christ as a sufferer a loss of you if you do not put away sin if you do not put away sin it means that we are crucifying jesus christ the second time he dies to destroy it he, he, because this is the, the, because the, the, the death of jesus christ is is is, is the, the second redemption plan of god to, to to rescue us to save us from sin so he that he carried all our sin because if you remember again, if we go back, go back to the to the leftical order. If, if, if we go back to the leftical order, we have to do surgery tomorrow. That's why I'm all dressed up. And now I brought you all and you as well. We said that. Uh, when we go back to the Le Le Levitical order, if you remember, we said every year they, they bring animals, goats, and everything for... for they come back around and bring you the plastic for nighttime and a little bit later. Who is that? Do you want to take the time out or with that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who is talking? Okay. 
so they they bring goats they bring bulls they, so so they have to sacrifice blood for 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 atonement of their sin and that was when jesus christ now came to make that atonement once and for all that we don't need animal atonement of sin again we don't need an animal sacrifice of bulls again so that jesus christ died once and for us for us so, so that is what he said so the beginning of all true mortification lies in the mind not in the penances or hardship upon the body so so that so that is the first approach the best approach to 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 towards mortification of sin is in your mind you have to make up that that decision not in the not in the penance not not in not in the suffering of the flesh of the body because we are not suffering in america here but this is applying also to yeah. us so it does not it does not mean that until until you are whipped on, 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 until they whip you or, or, or until they nail you to the cross before you before you suffer uh, um, uh, um, uh, for sin but it is in your mind the mind of man is carnal the mind of man is full of enmity the understanding is darkened, being or alternated from the life of God, as we read in Ephesians 4.18. Man is not a sincere creature, but we are partial, we are blind, we are wicked, until we are renewed and sanctified by the regeneration grace of God. So that is what the the, the 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 author says here in that verse one that therefore since christ suffered for us in the flesh he said we should arm ourselves with the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin who is disturbing us now then in verse two he said that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the loss of men but the will of god what does it mean by that he said how is it further explained he said the apostle explains what he means by being dead to sin and seizing from sin both negatively and positively negatively a christian ought no longer to live the rest of his time in the flesh to the sinful loss and corrupt desires of carnal wicked men but positively he ought to conform himself to the revealed will of the holy god so these are these are these are hard doctrines that people are going to ask questions tonight that that can we really understand what the author is saying here the loss of men are the springs of all wickedness the loss of men that is what, what, what do we mean by the loss of men? There are so many things. When, when somebody is in the world, like the, like, like the picture we sent out today, Jesus Christ said, very I say unto you, that it will be easy for, easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what he's saying is it's not necessarily money, it's not necessarily gold and silver. Anything, every anything in this world that we worship as second God is what is is what is saying here. Some people they they are properties. Some people they are children. Some people they they, they are their clothes. Some people they they are their, their profession. Some people just something that you, that you put that you put first before god that is what is the, the author is that's what jesus christ said to be easier for a camel to enter to the eye of a needle than for a rich man that is that is than for you that is serving a second god to enter the kingdom of god so in other words you have to put other and that's what jesus christ said go and sell go and sell and give to the poor 
in other words what christ is saying is that get rid of those because jesus christ has realized that this 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 word that he has in front of him is a stumbling block for him to enter the kingdom of heaven so they say go and sell what you have and follow me give to the poor and follow me but how many of us can do it we read, we read that we i mean we read the story every time but are we better than that young rich man are we not also having something that we are worshiping, hero worshiping uh, uh, more than Christ in our life? So true, so true conversion makes a fabulous change in the heart and the life of everyone who partakes of it. A true conversion. It brings a man off from all his old fashionable and delightful loss and from the common ways and vices of the world. To the will of God, it alters the mind, the judgment, the affection, the way and conversation of everyone who has experienced it. It is very difficult. How many has experienced it? It is very, very difficult. So, so what? So what? What the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the apostle is saying here is that. Uh, if you remember, we have some cross references to the Bible here. You see, in Romans 5, 3 to 5, it said, Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God loves has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Apostle Paul went further again in Romans 8, 18. He said, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then in Romans 8, 8, he said, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please god now we have some questions here which we are going to discuss tonight well i, I, I want to throw some light to, to these questions first you see because one thing is we, we say what is to be our purpose in life what does it mean that he who has suffered in the flesh assist from sin which is what the, uh, the apostle uh, peter wrote in verse one here and then in verse two to say what are we to live for what are you living for and but he went on before before we get to that one he said you see again that christ is our example he suffered for us so that we should be able or willing to suffer for him his suffering was definitely way more than we will ever suffer. We love because he first loved us. We are to arm ourselves with this attitude. It's very difficult. But and that implies several things. First, it implies that we are in a war. The Christian life is not a pleasure cruise. It is not a lazy river ride. It is a battle. It is a battle against Satan and his demons and evil. To win a war, you have to approach it with the right mentality and take it seriously. Most of the time, if a soldier just rambles into the battle thinking that victory will be easy, he will lose in the rout. And secondly, it shows that the right attitude could be a weapon. We normally wouldn't consider that our attitude is a weapon, but it is God. If God can use our attitude as a shining testimony to touch the lost for Christ, to bring glory to Him, and to turn back evil, we are not to be just passive. We are to proactive in deciding how we will respond if we do face persecution and suffering for Christ. 
We need to be mentally and spiritually prepared. If we are not mentally prepared to face suffering, then perhaps we will wither away when it comes. Suffering can come, trials can come, challenges can come at any time. So, so now, in, so in that verse one, it says verse one makes a connection between suffering and sanctification. MacArthur says that that suffering in the flesh is a sign that we are saved. But when the saved die, when those people that have been saved they die. We will have no more sin because there's no repentance in the grave. Once you die, there's no more sin. But however, here it seems to me to be referring to a more immediate purification from sin. That means that suffering on this earth now help us to overcome sin now. Suffering acts as a purifying force. How? It helps us to focus more on God. It protects us from complacency. It increases our dependence on God. It reminds us that the whole world is temporary and therefore we must not love the world or the things in the world. So that is what the Apostle Peter is saying here. And then in verse 2, verse 2 now reinforces this interpretation. The one who suffers will on earth be more in in, 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 interested in the will of God. It will be, it, it be less infatuated with the world. So this ties in with what James wrote about what trials bring about perseverance. So now, the question now, it, it, it's uh, because it, 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 in that verse 3, in that verse 3, the uh, Apostle Peter now listed out what, what are the type of sins that he is talking about. You see, because he has been giving us example of Jesus Christ, he's been uh, uh, admonishing us how, how we, we can mortify sin, how we can put sin to check through our mind, through our determination, through our courage. But he has not listed out the, the type of sins that, that we may be thinking about or that we may not even know about. So that is why he is now saying in that verse 3 that for we have spent enough of our time, our pastor, in doing the will of the Gentiles. That is, the Gentiles, they, they, they don't have any, uh, 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 any cause to abstain from sin. But we have cause to abstain from sin because we have already been saved. And we have already been told the consequences of sin. The Gentiles were not told the consequences of sin. So, 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 they, they have free tickets to sin. But he said, but we were also like them before. But he is now saying that enough in, we have already spent enough time with these Gentiles. And then we say, when we now walk in lewdness, in loss, in drunkenness, in reverse, in drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Then in verse 4, he said, In regard to this, these Gentiles, they will not think it strange that you do not run with them, that, that is, you have not abandoned them, because when you don't no longer walk with them. Then they say, This is strange, but, but he was one, one of our mates before, he was our colleague. So then they speak evil of you. So that is what the Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter is now saying here. That, that, that when, when, when you now abandon these people, what are they going to say about you? So, so, so it is now enforcing verse, that verse 3 that for the time past of our life may survive us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Here the Apostle argues from equity. It is but just, equal, and reasonable that as you have hitherto all the former part of your life serve sin and Satan. So you should now serve the living God. Though those who were Jews to whom the apostle wrote, yet the living among the Gentiles, they had learned their way. 
So in other words, we are now hearing that this letter was written also to the Jews and also to the Gentiles because a lot of Gentiles were converted again as Christian believers. And that was when uh, uh, Peter and the, uh, and the Apostle Paul had argument about bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. So, so the Gentiles were prevailed upon to change their ways. And that was when the argument of the circumcision of the flesh and circumcision of the, uh, of the spirit comes into, into argument. That the Gentiles, they are not talking to, to circumcise the flesh, but to circumcise the, 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 the heart, circumcision of the heart, cleansing of the heart, to have a, co a covenant with God. So that is what is now saying that one, when a man is truly converted, it is very grievous to, to him to think how the time past of his life has been spent. The hazard he has run so many years, the mischief he has done to others, the dishonor done to God, and the loss he has sustained are very afflicting to him. I want to take that one again. This, this concerns me, it concerns all of us, that when a man is truly converted, when you sit down and you start meditating about your past life, it will be grievous to you to think how time price of your life has been spent, the hazard you have run for so many years, the mischief you have done to others, the dishonor done to God, and the loss he has sustained are very afflicting to him. Then number two, while the will of man is unsanctified and corrupt, he works continually in wicked ways. When he doesn't have any conscience, he makes them his choice and delight, his work and business, and he makes a bad condition, daily worse and worse. Three, one sin allowed draws on another. Here are six named and they have a connection and dependence on one upon another. So, so Apostle Peter now listed six sins. One of them is lavishness or wantonness, expressed in looks, in gesture, in behavior. As, as Apostle Paul put it in Romans 13, 13, wantonness, people that don't care. Then, then loss acts as Lord act as 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 a lewdness such as wardom and adultery, fornication. Then number three, excess excess of wine. Though short of drunkenness and immoderate use of it, that is that is it is not saying that it was not drink, but drunkenness, excess of drunk that is to become a drunkard. And when you become a drunkard, you lose all senses. To the prejudice of health or business is here condemned. The number four, reveling or luxurious feasting. Too frequent, too full, too expensive. That is what we, our politicians are doing today. And this was a typical example of the, of the prodigal son. That, that he got his, his own inheritance, he, is, he, he spent it reveling, luxurious feasting. The number five, banqueting, by which is meant gluttony or excess in eating. The number six, abominable idolatry. The idol worship of the Gentiles was attended with lewdness, with drunkenness, with gluttony, and also of brutality and cruelty. And these Jews living long among them, we are, some of them at least debunched and corrupted by such practices, they join them. For it is a Christian's duty not only to abstain from what is grossly wicked, but also from those things that are generally the occasion of sin or carry the appearance of evil. Excess of wine and immoderate feasting are forbidden as well as lost and idolatry. Now, 
the question now that covers that verses 1 to 3 is in our own present life here we are in america how do we understand sin where where do we consider ourselves that that we can easily commit sin from all the things that we have read tonight in that verses one to six What does it mean that the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles? Have we, uh, have we or are we in a situation here in America likely to commit all these sins that the Apostle Peter is writing here? Can anybody, uh, can anybody tell us? Sir, because one thing it's, uh, it's so difficult for us in America here to be able to differentiate or to draw a line between what is sin and what is uh, so uh, an action that is inevitable that is just how you, it, it, it is, is the way of life. It does not really mean whether you are a Christian or not. And and, and um, like like today now, we we have never had anything before called conspiracy theory. It is it is just in the last two years that I started hearing conspiracy theory, and conspiracy theory has not been perfected. That has not become a way of life. And be, be, ten years ago, to tell lies. To see to see the American telling lie, it's it's, it's abomination. It's a book. 
or telling lies, just the order of the day now. Denying fat is the order of the day now. And we are bringing up children. New graduates are coming on board and, and unfortunately, the internet, the Twitter, all these things are accessible to all these young, young uh, 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 minds that are bringing up. So do we think a time is going to come that telling lies or deceiving or, or, or misinformation, which before it used to be a heresy or something, is, is, is going to be a lesser sin or it's going to cease to be a sin? So, so what is the definition of sin then? Because it seems as if sin is already losing its, its, um, its definition. And that is that is that is the challenges we have today because all these people we are talking about are all Christians. They are not Gentiles. So so in, 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 so in that case, um, what are the challenges that um, uh, the new generations we have, especially the, the youths in, in in growing up in America today? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you for, Liz, for the exposition that you just gave. Enlighten us and expand on this um, chapter. So, um, I think your question came from uh, verse 3. Yes, sir. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, sin. Yeah. We see that um, for uh, sorry, Peter, mm. um, of course, tried to put a time spin on this uh, by saying that for the for the time already passed, it is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. So the time we've had our time. So I know your question was challenges that uh, the young generation now have in dealing with sin. Yeah. So, if, if first of all, Peter acknowledged that the people that he was addressing have, have indulged in sin. We've already been doing, you know, indulged in some excesses um, in some sensual pleasures that are sinful. And today we see that, of course, the, the internet that you mentioned earlier is polluted. Now we see even with your cell phone that you carry, you know there are messages that you don't you did not solicit. Mm -hmm. We have all these uh, Facebook, you open your Facebook. You should even listen to how many things apart from your phone. Hmm. It's messages, you know, that you don't select, you know, you so a lot of avenues where you know if your mind is not guarded, as Peter said, that we should arm ourselves. We should arm ourselves. That's meaning we should prepare ourselves to face these challenges. That's true. But the time has passed now. So now that we have accepted Christ, now that we have salvation, we have the blessings, the blessing of knowing Him, we should now be in a place where we can protect ourselves by arming ourselves with the word, protect ourselves with these excesses these sensual pleasures, with these things that can derail us from the, um, the, the holy will of God, which is to, to keep us free from sin, right? The freedom from sin. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is now our young people are having. 
is that they are being bombarded with so much information. Mm -hmm. They are being bombarded with so much diluted, um, you know, spiritual stuff mm -hmm. that it becomes hard to decipher what is um, acceptable. That's true. From what is not. That's true. Gay and lesbianism and you know all these things are now being portrayed as okay. That's right. You know, and the activities that go with that. In fact, they have been taught in school that mm. this is acceptable. Good How point. do they decipher? How do they determine what is okay and what is not? So Peter is trying to tell us to arm ourselves because these things are going to happen. These things are coming at you hmm. from every angle at rapid speed. That's right. When you didn't know the word, when you didn't, uh, you did not have salvation. Yes, you are, that's excusable. But now he said in verse three, now the time already passed sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, right. having pursued a cause of sensual, uh, sensuality, lust, drunkenness, all those things. But now, so today, these are the things that I think, you know, we all have to contend with to maintain our salvation and to be able to, to free ourselves from sin. I, I will stop there. Now, the, the question I want to ask you now, it's, um, for me, I don't have any problem because all my children are all grown up and some of them are already having their own children. So, so the, so the problem, the question I want to ask you is also their problem. I'm a grandfather now. But for you people that are still raising up kids, how can the church, or, or let me say, how can we, the elders, help our own children? How can a parent help his own children, help their own children? Because it is okay for the father or the mother to be granted in the word of God. But how can he impact the children? To prepare them to be said on to, to, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And the salvation of the father is not going to save the, the, the is not is not going to save his, his own children. So what are what are the obligations of the parents now, especially Christian parents to their children? Or uh, and how can we now uh, motivate those parents? Because not many of not many of them, we know that not many of them care about the upbringing of their children. We see them, but but are we going to throw away the tower and just give up, or do you think there's anything we can do to help them? Because now I know that as far as you concerned, uh, Kabo, you are spending time with your own children teaching them, but, but it's not happening to all the parents. Is there anything we can do or there's nothing we can do? Can I ask you? Well, uh, we, there's things we could do. Uh, it's about engaging our children um, and their friends and in the church, engaging the children in active or in activities that can bring a lot of things, challenges they face to light so that they could understand these things in context with what the world says. Because it's too many times we um, focus too much into theology, um, explaining these things historically in the context of um, the um, uh, 400, you know, AD, we forget 
that we are talking to people who live in the 21st century. Hmm. So we are not able to bring what's happening or interpret what's happened, what, yes, what the, the apostles were going through in those days, bring it to today's society to make a parallel, to draw parallels, or to, to, to make an association and use those um, relationships to be able to, to, to teach and explain to the younger, the younger generation, the, the kids, so that they can see, they can understand the challenges that they have been thrust into or thrust at them. So we teach the world, of course, the paramount way hmm. of addressing this issue constantly. You see, the, um, the, 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 the children going to school, they have peer pressure. Going to college, they have peer pressure. In fact, verse 4 here says, in all these, say they, are, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation that they, mal that they malign you. You see, so they, they want you to their friends would like for them to pursue evil, as they use the word here, this patient, to pursue evil with them. Mm -hmm. If they don't join them, they kind of mock them. They would call them names. Sure. So they have been coerced into doing the things that the friends would like them to do, to engage in the things that are ungodly, mm -hmm. things that they should not be doing. So, but if you are able to, it's not just about teaching them just the word, but also instilling confidence in our children, because that's how we prepare them. Mm -hmm. If they have a, a mind of their own, they are able to say no. They are able to chart their own path, to understand that they are not in competition with others, but they are in competition with themselves to make sure that they accomplish the things that they want to accomplish. If we can build that confidence in them, knowing that it is okay to say no, it is okay not to do this, they will call you names, but it's okay. You have confidence in yourself. You know what you're trying to accomplish. I think we will succeed in helping our children to chart their path without being polluted by their friends or the society in which they live. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, from what I gather now, it's as if to say there is very little that the church, the pastors can do apart from this Bible study class which we are trying to encourage them to come to because we, we can't we cannot force the parents to come to bible study class and there's no way a pastor or an elder preaching can convey this kind of uh, explanation this kind of message to them within the for a 30 to 45 minutes of preaching so is there any other way that we can be of help to them or because to be quite honest I, I i don't think even the, the the pastor in charge of the children ministry can really do much within the hours uh, uh, maybe one or two hours that uh, she's allowed in the, in the in the children ministry so that's pastor Lombo, yeah I, I think the the avenues that probably we can we can um, explore could be um, things like um, doing uh, what they call them. You know, when you go away and an uh, outing. Uh, I'm sorry. An outing. Yeah, like, like an outing. A retreat. A retreat. That's, that's the word. A retreat. Because in a retreat, when you have, for example, the men mm. go on a retreat or okay. whatever. Women or whatever. Okay, the women, that's you, right. Mm -hmm. You have an undefined 
divide, you have the undivided attention mm -hmm. of the people that are in that retreat. That's on that right. retreat. And if you have a program where if it's a day or two days retreat, you are able to go through that program That's with true. the people that are part of that. And I think you will be you have a full day That's where true. all you'll be doing are activities. And I think people can benefit from that. Yeah, there will be agree with better you. bonding. There will be better understanding. And, you know, it can, it can benefit. It's not just a one-off thing, but something that has to be done on an annual basis. I agree with you. 100%. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now, <clears throat> now we go on to chapter uh, verse 4. Is it, in regard to this, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Here, we have the visible change right in those who are in the foregoing verse. They were represented as having been in the former part of their life. Very wicked, that they were very wicked. They no longer run on in the same courses or with the same companions. We all, we all have had our own days. I was in the world myself. Well, God called me. God saved me. I could have been dead by now, dead to dead in sin. Well, God called me to, to give me a second chance, or a third chance, perhaps, or fourth time. So here, observe the conduct of their wicked acquaintances towards them. Like uh, Edakago, I just explained now. They think it's strange. They are surprised and wonder at it as it's something new and unusual that their old friends should be so much altered and not run with as much violence as they used to do to the same excess of riot, to the same sottish excesses and luxury, which before they are greedily and madly followed. They speak evil of them. Their surprise carries them to blasphemy. They speak evil of their persons, of their way, of their religion, of their God. What we learn here, one, those that are once really converted will not return to their former course of life. Though ever so much tempted by the frowns of phalateries of others to do so, Neither persuasion nor reproach will prevail with them to be or to do as they were wont to do. I'm a living witness of that one too. I had a riotous life, I enjoyed myself. I had power. I command respect. I command. Um, shall I say popularity or, or fame? And at that time, I thought that was everything. The last thing I wanted, ever wanted to be in my life to be to be a pastor, because I just I just I, I look down on on pastors as poor people, even though there are no more poor pastors in Africa today. Now they all write in jets now. But in my days, they were all poor people. If they say they were riding in the jets, maybe I would have become a pastor 20 years or 30 years ago. But God called me at, at, at the late hour. People were mocking me. They said, what is he going to do in America? At what age? He's going to die. Because pastoral work is not for, young, it's not for old people, it's for young people. And that's why you see so many young pastors dying today now because of stress. So, so, so when my sister now told them at home, I said, Chief Lambo has Chief 
to Theophilus Labo, I say our royal highness, I say our chief. They say he's no, no, he's no longer a chief. He say what? He say pastor. They say don't, don't, be, don't be ridiculous. He say what? He say he's a pastor. They just started laughing. He say what kind of pastor is that one? He says a born again Christian. No, he's a born wuru wuru Christian. He can never be a born again Christian. He must be a born wuru wuru Christian. Lambo, a pastor. No, 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 wuru wuru Christian. That won't be. Nobody will believe it. And I don't blame them. And that is why they continue to see me on YouTube every every Sunday, every every month. Before they finally believe that this man has completely been taken off, taken away from us. It can't go back again. It took me time before I could uh, introduce myself as Pastor Lambo to people. Every first Sunday of the month, we, we dress you know, with our postural gown. As soon as we leave the church, I remove that white color so people will not see me with that white color. Say, this man is a pastor. But now I can probably wear it to anywhere. But it took me time to be identified as a pastor. Even my own children took them time to, re to refer to me as Pastor Lambo. They call me Mr. Lambo. Even Philippa that is in California, yeah, that is in, saw everything, she called me Mr. Lambo. Because they were not used to it. So that is what he's saying here. That's what this Apostle Paul is saying. Apostle Peter is saying here. You see, the temper and the behavior of true Christians seem very strange to ungodly men. That they should despise that which everyone else is fond of. That they should believe many things which to others seem incredible. That they should delight in what is irksome or tedious, bazillious, where they have no visible interest to serve. And depend so much upon hope is what the ungodly cannot comprehend. To depend upon hope. Hope for what? And that is why Apostle, Apostle Thomas said, No, I will not believe until I see with my Kurokoro eye. The stab on his palms and the wrist before I can believe. How can I hope for something when, 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 uh, 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 I, I, I am in, in, in the flesh. Hope? Hope for what? But now I can hope. Now I have faith. Now I can depend upon God. Now I can, I can, I, I can stay without anything because I have hope that God will provide. But it took me time. So those are all the things that, that, that it is difficult to preach. It's not, you can't preach it unless you experience it. And when you tell them as your own personal testimony, they say, don't believe it. So the best actions of religious people cannot escape the censors and the slanders of those who are irreligious. We just cannot, whether we like it or not. So these actions which cause a good man, which cause a good man the most pain, hazard, and self-denial, shall be most censored by uncharitable and ill nature world. They will ridicule you. And I'm sure uh, the cargo too must have been experiencing this. Because five years ago, he was not pro, uh, proficient in religious uh, talk, talk, talk like this before. But now he's an expert. He's even more than a pastor now. So, so, so that is what we are now seeing. And the same thing goes with my general overseer too. But now, every, every, we cannot call Mr. Mana, you say Pastor James Mana. It took time before you can recognize somebody as Pastor James Mana. It took time. So for the so so the comfort of the servant of God, it is here added that all wicked people, especially those who speak evil of such as are not as bad as themselves, shall give account. All those people that speak evil of us, all of us, they will give account, and they be put to give a reason of their behavior to him who is ready to judge, who is both able and duly authorized. 
a who we hear long joy and pass sentence upon all those that shall be found alive and of such as been dead shall be raised again. So that is where he's saying that the people preach to the people that are dead, that is, they will rise again, as we read in James 3 8 and 9. So, 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 so the manigland world shall, in a little time, give an account to the great God of all their evil speech against, the, against his people. They will soon be called to a sad account for all their curses, their foolish jests, their slanders and falsehood uttered against the faithful people of God. Two, that for this cause was the gospel preached also to those that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. That is verse 6. Some understand this difficult place thus, for this cause was the gospel preached to all the faithful of old who are now dead in Christ, that thereby they might be taught and encouraged to bear the unrighteous judgment and persecutions which the rage of men put upon them in the flesh, but might live in the spirit unto God. Others take the expression that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. So, 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 in other words, whether they are dead or alive, on the day of resurrection, everybody will be judged. So, that is what he's saying here. So, the multiplying of our sin and living to God are the expected effects of the gospel preached to us. God will certainly reckon with all those who have had the gospel preached to them. But without these good effects produced by it, they hear it, but they did not do it. So they are hearers alone, but not doers of the word. So God is ready to judge all those who have received the gospel in vain. So it is no matter how we are judged according to men in the flesh, if we do but live according to God in the spirit. So that is what the author is saying here for us tonight. That people will mock us. People will ridicule us, as the general Vasya has said, that our relatives, our relatives will mock us. But my own general Vasya is lucky that uh, his father was uh, a Jehovah Witness, if I'm correct again. So, 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 that, so, that he, so he started uh, preaching about Jesus Christ when he was young. But when he, when he got to London now, when he changed to Buddhism, did anybody uh, 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 crucify you, sir? Or criticize you? No, nobody did. Nobody did. Mm -hmm. What about Dr. Osman? When you converted to Christianity, did anybody make any reference at all? So in other words, like um, the general Vasya was telling us that we just have to have courage, determination, that we must expect people to slander us. We must expect people to ridicule us. We must expect people to question, to query our judgment. But we must understand that it's because they do not understand. And they cannot understand if they have not had that encounter with Jesus Christ. It's not possible. You can you, you can you can you can you can give your testimony to them, but you cannot say that personal experience with them. And that is why it is difficult for them to understand. Very, very, very difficult for them to understand what you have gone through. So Peter reminds his readers that they have already experienced living in the flesh and what it has to offer them. He described a number of the works of the flesh which we have already talked about. So, so if you do not go back to these temptations again, 
your old friends, your drink buddies, and your sin partners will be surprised. They will try to pressure you to give in. In doing so, they will verify you. They will make fun of you. They may use titles like Know It All, a Goody Two Shoes, Mr. Perfect, or Stick in the Mud, or Party Popper, etc. They want to portray someone who resists these temptations as narrow minded, judgmental, or boring, prudish, dull. Don't give in to their peer pressure. How can you resist peer pressure? What should you do when someone or a group is pressurizing you to do something wrong? I think Dr. Kagba has already explained that to us. That you have to speak that to your own children. Don't give in. Know the Christ that you are serving. So in that verse 5, Peter reminds his readers that every person will have to give an account for his action. God sees the evil that they are doing, and they will have to answer to God for that. In the same vein, God will also see if you join in with them, and you will have to answer for that. Each of us is responsible for our own action. Your parents' faith will not vindicate you when you face God, but neither will your family members' sin condemn you. This is why God's judgment is perfectly fair and just. Now, let's come back again to this question here. I want, I want to take it again. Your parents' faith will not vindicate you when you face God. Neither will your family members' sin condemn you. Now, the Bible says that I will avenge the sin of the parent or those that 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 uh, 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 reject me from their from their children and their uh, uh, up to the fourth generation. And the Bible is now saying that we are not going to answer for the sin of our ancestors. And sometimes do we pray that that uh, God may remove the cause of the the curse of the ancestors. So we have contradiction here. Are we now are we now free from the causes of our ancestors, or 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 or, or there was or there was never anything like the cause of the ancestors? So in other words, was there any need for that prayer at all? Because my father's sin or my my grandfather's sin, and I'm and I'm now a pastor. Am I still am I, am I still going to be punished for his own sin? Can somebody enlighten us on that one? Because otherwise, there's no point in saying that prayer that, that, that let, 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 let us pray for, for, for God to remove the sin, the sin of, our, our, of our fathers or the sin of our ancestors uh, or, 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 or the causes of our ancestors. Because he's saying here that your parents' faith will not vindicate you when you face God, but neither will your family members sin condemn you. And this is why God's judgment is perfectly fair and just. Whenever we are considering the temptations of the world, remember that God is watching. He will record what you do and you will have to explain your action to him one day. So, are you, am I still in danger of my father's or my grandfather's sin? Can somebody please to throw light to us? Hello? Hello? I think people are hanging up as well. Hello, Hello Bang. <laughs>
that cost is not, you, you, don't, you don't, you know, um, participate in that anymore. It doesn't follow you and your generation. That cost has to be your great grandfather, but you are not children anymore. So you need to think, you need to think, you know, so that that generation has to be proper because you have the power to do that. But the kingdom of the Holy Spirit to do that. That's true. You know, and that's why I believe that that's all things, right? Our faith, you know, we stand in the gap, not just for family, for the nation. You know, they are constant for a particular nation in a particular group of people. And as believers, that's what we do. We stand in the gap. That's true. Break the gap. That's true. Yes, we have the power to break, but we are not having as much as we break the gap. But because why? We have become by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's true. And we are operating under this new covenant. Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. you know, that by his stripes we are here, but about the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, the hope. Thank you, sir. We cannot pass by the generation that cost them all. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Can you close the prayer for us now? Thank you, sir. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you all the praise and give you all the glory. Father, we thank you for your wonderful speech that you're before us, for what is speech that is trying to encourage us. You know, to be steadfast in our faith. Father, we pray, O oh God, your Lord, that in spite of all the temptations, in spite of all the challenges that we face, may we continue to be steadfast, Lord. We pray that you continue to strengthen us, each and every one of us, Father, that we continue to forge forth, forge forth, forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our instructor tonight. We thank you for all those who are on the line tonight, on the line tonight. I pray, Lord, that you continue to minister to each and every one of us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, that their persecution will come in various ways. Well, Father, that we'll be able to withstand those persecutions. Yes, we have come far, Lord, you brought us from the world, and we will not go back and participate in the things of the world, but we'll be the light in the darkness, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for the teaching tonight. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Can we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the the love of God. God. And the sweet fellowship of the Holy Holy Spirit. Rest remain in the body of God. Now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We must not mercy for the all of us. All the days of our lives. And we shall be in the house of the Lord. For ever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. I didn't know the time has already gone. <laughs> I was enjoying it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. I didn't know the time has gone. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> thank you.